friends, it's the bird emergency after dark. Let's do a bit of Sky News. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm Paul Murphy. No, what's it? What's that joker's name? Is that his name? Paul Murphy. And 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 there's Rowan Dean. No, don't. Let's not be silly. I'm Grant Williams. This is the bird emergency. It's um, the PM edition. I'm joined by Chad Criddle tonight and. Chad is the senior keeper, birds and free flight at the Adelaide Zoo, uh, which is part of Zoo's SA, which we'll talk about in a moment. And Chad's got the guiding hand over um, most of the bird stuff that's happening over there, especially the captive breeding programs, of which we're all very interested in the orange-bellied parrot, regent, honey eater, and a bunch more. But we'll get to all of that. Hi, Chad. Thanks for joining us. No worries at all. Thank you so much for having me on. I really, really appreciate the chance to get together and chat all things feathered, being a being a passionate bird nerd myself for, you know, since I can remember. So it's always good to shoot the breed with fellow bird lovers. Well, let, let's start there. I, I was reading that your, your career as a zookeeper sort of began in 2009, I think, I think it was. But you preceded that for volunteering for about six years at the free flight show at Taronga. So tell us, are you a Sydney kid? And when did the <laughs> bird bug get you? Let's find out how you became a bird nerd. I, I am a Sydney kid. I am a, I am a, um, you've caught me out. I'm an East Coaster, although now I've translocated to South Australia, which I love, but I grew up on the, uh, grew up on the Northern beaches of Sydney and my family's all still there. I, I, I have a, a great fondness for the place. Um, but yeah, I, you know, like most kids growing up in suburban Australia, particularly around a big city, you've got certainly a limit on the wildlife that you see around you you know there's blue tongue lizards in most of our back gardens and there certainly was where i was growing up um but the one thing that you see all around you is birds it's one of the it's one of the great things about birds is that they do you do see them around our city areas and so they were always around um and i liked them and and was interested in them but um, the free flight show at Taronga opened in 1997. And so I was, I was seven years old when it opened. And so I went along with my family and watched this show and we'd always go to the zoo and we'd watch the seal shows or, or whatever was going on. Um, but watch this bird show. And I remember there was a moment in the show where it was a, a blue and gold macaw at the time who, who just flew in out of nowhere or it seems Swooped to be nowhere. Yeah. Exactly. Came down out of the sky like it appeared, landed on this person's hand, and it just blew my mind as a seven-year-old. It just, I, yeah. I reckon, Chad, I mean, I've, I've obviously got a few summers on you, but I went to, to the free flight show at Taronga in, I'm thinking, 98 or 99, mm -hmm. and... Oh, it must have been the same bird, I reckon, that I was struck by um, by the size. Uh, the, the, the size of the macaw, um, I think that was the first one I'd seen close. I obviously seen them in, in zoos, but at the end of a long flight, Avery, and you just mm -hmm. don't get that feeling of how of how large they are, the, how long the tail is, you know. that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so seeing them yeah. seeing them in action seeing them in action just puts them in a different light and it would have been the same macaw there was only ever one blue and gold macaw that appeared in the taronga free flight actually um and yeah it got me hooked so following on from that my poor family had to sit through many a chad's bird show at home with budgies or cockatiels or whatever i had at yeah. home at the time and then when i was 13 so i was a i was a I was a theatre kid. I loved performing and did drama and so on. Have we seen oh, you on you TV at the school spectacular? 
because uh, we we used to get mm-hmm. that once a year. That would be on telly in Melbourne um, when the mm-hmm. uh, uh, and the Estedford. That was a that was a Sydney thing as well. So were you in? Were you yes. in those things as well as being a bird nerd with your, your cockatiels? And I, you must have had bird yes. parrots too, did you? <laughs> I never had a Burke's parrot. You know what? And I and I I love them. They are one of my favourite species, but I've never had one. Um, I didn't appear in Rocker Stedford or in or in in um, in those in those uh, in those ones, but I did appear on television. So I don't know if you remember. Um, Comedy Inc., which was a, a skit show oh, on yes, Channel Nine, yeah, that, um, yes, didn't last too long, but I do remember that. No, one. yes, well, I was on, just, I was in two skits. Just forgive me, well, I just, I'm just seeing whether Burke's parrot is still acceptable or whether we have to call it the uh, something else nowadays because I'm, t- I'm old. <laughs> and um, no, Burke's Burke's parrot is still my understanding of it. Um. Yes, but yeah, I appeared on. Good. Found I've it. checked. I um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I appeared on Comedy Inc. and I did a bunch of TV commercials and I did some professional theatre work when I was a kid. So I appeared in a um, professional production of Wizard of Oz and I was in a professional production of Oliver. Um, but when that all like that kind of wrapped up when I was about thirteen and I wanted to keep practicing presentations and so they started this youth volunteer program at Taronga and so I joined up when I was 13 and spent every weekend school holidays at the zoo until I graduated school and then straight out of school was lucky enough to get um, casual work as a zookeeper so you know it started what's been you know so far a lifelong adventure and obsession with birds but also the work that we do with them so apart from the hands-on work working with the 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 shows and and we'll talk about that's been extensive over Mm -hmm. over your career have you gone and done uh, a a science or ecology or or something as well as a a, as a um, you know your father always says I want you to go (laughs) Go and get get a qualification in case this bird stuff doesn't work out, son. <laughs> did you ever get that talk? I, I I certainly didn't. I was very lucky. I had parents who basically said, "You figure out what you want to do, and you find the path," which was very very lovely of them. I did start a, I did start a degree, so I started a biodiversity conservation degree at um, Macquarie in Sydney, which I still could probably go back and finish, but I did a year of it. And then during that time, I was working pretty regularly at the zoo. And that it became pretty clear that that was my area of passion and focus. And the opportunity came. Yeah. And the opportunity came to do it permanently. And so I took that opportunity. Following on from that, I've done a. So the standard qualification for a zoo professional in Australia is a certificate three from TAFE um which i which i've completed um and then yeah it's it's just gone from there certainly we work in partnership with you know we we hire we've got ecologists on the books at zoos sa and so on but for my for the work that i do um and for certainly the career path i i ended up being attracted to it wasn't it wasn't needed for me at that point. So I, I, I took the work and, and decided to go down that path. But, you know, no door is ever closed. I would never be opposed to going back or looking into it if the, if the passion and the drive drove me that way. But at, at the moment, that hasn't, that hasn't popped up. But, um, yeah, it's certainly, it was certainly the trajectory I started down and the, and the, the role of the academic and so on didn't quite jump out to me at the time. And so, yeah, so here I am. I think um, people would probably be surprised at the amount of presentations. So I'll call them that, the, 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 the yep. shows, but interactions with the public and demonstrating what, um, uh, what you can communicate about conservation and about science by entertaining people with birds, um, that's pr- 
probably not the complete way to frame it, but you've done over oh. 3,500 of these things uh, and not only in Australia. So uh, I didn't know that there was like, that there was such a demand uh, for them. Yeah. So how important, um, how important are they in the, in, let's look at Adelaide, in the operation of Adelaide Zoo? Um, well, the free flight bird show is one of the one of the key um, draw cards and programs. Certainly, from a visitor interaction perspective, that we run at Adelaide, it's the large scale animal shows or any form of interaction with public from a staff member at a zoo. More and the more and more that we understand of it, and the more and more work that gets published on it, is the is the real way that us as organisations make a difference, particularly with people who are sitting on the fence about conservation. It's certainly, you know, if you're a if you're an avid bird nerd already, or if you're an avid herp nerd, or or whatever your passion area is, going to a zoo and seeing a keeper talking about orangutans and orangutan conservation, for example. You, you don't need to be pushed over the fence. But the reality is, is there's, you know, millions of people visit a zoo in Australia every year. And around the world, it's an astronomical figure of people go through the gates of accredited can, zoos. Can you give us an, an idea of what the visitor numbers are for Adelaide? Yeah, we sit at about, obviously, the last two years has been yeah very different. Yeah. Um, but care. an average... Yeah, an average year prior to that would be about half a million people would go through go through the gates, and which for a small for city Ad is that's for Adelaide. Is that yeah. Adelaide only, or does that include Monato? Because um, they, let, let, let's introduce Monato and the Zoos SA set up while we're having yeah. this little chat too. So I would say actually it would be it would be the two combined from the last year that we got that figure, um, and so Zoo South Australia is. Um, it's a not-for-profit, um, not-for-profit charitable organisation. So we're non-government, and we're um, owned by our membership. So if you're a if you're a zoo member to our two properties, you can vote at the AGM and so on. Um, but we operate the two sites. So we operate Adelaide Zoo, which is in the in the centre of Adelaide, basically. For those of you who haven't visited, it's right next to the Botanic Gardens. It's one of the, if not the smallest major city zoo in Australia in terms of land size, mm. but it's the second oldest. So it's the second oldest behind uh, Melbourne and has been in operation for over 130 years. And then Monato opened its doors in the 90s and it's, a, it's out near a town called Murray Bridge, which is a, a satellite city. And... Monato started as a basically an overflow for large hoof stock, and then and that, followed. And that was a, that was a private concern, wasn't it? And then they they hit hard times. Is that no? Is that, so that, that was the story, right? Or was that a different different one? That was a different park. So um, Monato was Monato was actually originally purchased by um, the Don Dunstan government. Um, whichever one Don Dunstan was a part of, and he he, he, he was um, minister for the arts, uh, I believe. Well, he famous for his pink uh, safari suit. Um, yes, but but he that was yes. uh, um, uh, Labor government. In, I think that uh, in the mid seventies, I think it began. I think Don Dunstan yes. was he was a premier when I was in late primary school may have even been earlier but uh yeah don dunson was very very much he was the groovy politician when i was a kid <laughs> so and so and, yeah, well, the, pink, and he's... the pink safari suit was all the go and yeah I love it. australia became <laughs> adelaide became the city of the arts basically because of don dunston i think so well his legacy in that space is undeniable um for our city but they purchased that land originally as a, it was going to be a satellite city development. So they were going to, it was going to be building suburbia basically. 
And when that didn't happen, um, the Department of Environment had a setup there, which was basically a setup of aviaries for confiscated animals and things like that. And it was and gifted to the society. Think, uh, yeah, quarantine for a bit yeah. too. Yeah. Um, and then it was gifted to the Zoo Society, basically as overflow. Um, and then Monato Safari Park opened its doors in the 90s as Monato Zoo hmm. and has slowly grown over over the years and is, it is currently the largest zoo property on the planet. So in terms of actual land size of the property, it is the biggest in the world. So you can fit every major zoo in Australia into yeah, Monaco and have and have space left over. It's enormous. Um, so and it, a lot of that... It, sorry, Chad, it, it would be a logical sort of partner... Uh, to what Dubbo has been doing at, in because they're similar kinds of uh, um, uh, locations in that they're a long way from, from major cities and that they are dry land sort of exactly. rangeland properties. So um, obviously for large mammals, they're really good. But w what's the focus of, of Monato? in the zoo's SA setup? So certainly the the approach that to most visitors is Monato is geared as like a safari. So you go to Monato, you ride the bus, and it's more of a day out safari adventure yeah. where you're looking you're looking at animals in large range um, habitats. Certainly though one of the benefits of Monato though is the amount of space we have is what we can do behind the scenes so certainly from a, an organisational perspective, there's a lot of programs that occur up there behind the scenes where we've got the space to isolate things. So, for example, our, our con contribution to the Plains Wanderer um, breeding program, it takes place up there. Our contribution to... So we were one of the major partners in the Maliemi Wren translocations that occurred um, back into South Australia and we did all the analogous work on capture and restraint and transport. Can I just butt in there? Was that the yeah. um, the project that Simon Verdon was doing? Yes. So working okay. to okay. move you, you, move you, Mali you, Yeah. Okay. You, you you know we did you know we've we've done done an episode with Simon. So Yeah. Um, and that was uh, I mean uh, a, a learning experience I think. That one? For sure. And certainly from our perspective, what we did originally was we did work with Rufus Crowned, um, Rufus Crowned uh, Wrens as an analogous species to kind of basically figure out all our capture and restraint, transport, handling, um, and so on. But then also following on from that, it's been um, captive breeding trials with that species to get all of our techniques down pat. So that when Mali Emu Wrens come in as a key part of the program too, which was part of the partnership, that we've done all the all the husbandry techniques with a more common analogous species that enabled us to to you know deliver on goals better with the Mali Emu Wrens. So, in in your collection, you've got mm -hmm. over a thousand birds, but you're breeding over a hundred species. Is that no, yeah. no, you're keeping no, you're keeping a hundred species. Sorry. Yeah. So, how many of those hundred are you breeding? And then, mm -hmm. and you've you've just mentioned that you're preparing for Maliemi wrens and whatnot. I'd be really interested to know what are the the Australian birds that you are currently breeding with a a view to have an insurance. Uh, be part of a you know insurance stock mm -hmm. uh, with with the Australian zoos network. So certainly, so within Australia, we've got an organisation called the Zoo and Aquarium Association, and they're a an accrediting body as well as a, a facilitator of our managed breeding programs across the country. So um, they administer, for example, the Orange Billy Parrot breeding program, which we're a part of. Um, and then there are a multitude of other species that they work with across the board. With birds, we're a part of 11 out of the 15 programs. So that includes 
uh, cassowaries, uh, little penguins, uh, orange belly parrots, regent honey eaters, rose crowned fruit doves, um, black wing stilts, white browed wood swallows, and Swifties. Are you so Swifties, interestingly, Swifties are currently in the process of being upgraded to a managed breeding program, but they have not been for the last decade. Um, okay. But we've been working in the Swift, we've been working in the Swift parrot space for the last 10 years. Um, so there are a number of species, for example, that aren't managed that we still actively are involved with well, that, from a conservation that, standpoint. That's really, really the question, because the, the managed programs start then sort of get uh, they get their, their a comms team behind them, right? And then so the publicity goes out about mm -hmm. what's happening. I'm really interested in those birds that are not at that stage yet. Like mm -hmm. um, I saw in the material that you gave me, there was um, a focus on palm cockatoos. There's yep. eastern bristle birds have been, a, there's been a focus on trying to breed them. So what, what, are, what are you trying to, to get mm -hmm. going because it's all a matter of, I mean, you, you're coming from a, a background that I had as a kid too. Aviculture, you're trying to, you get, you get some birds and then you try and, you try and breed them. You try and give them the, the, the environment for them to breed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not much different. I mean, you know, the too simple, but whether it's a canary, a budgie, a zebra finch or an Eastern bristle bird, the challenges are the same. You've got to give them what they need and make mm -hmm. them comfortable enough to do what comes naturally. So, yeah. Um, so apart from those icon species that we that we know about, Mally fowl. I saw some information about Mally fowl. How, yeah. What is there a long list? Is it a long shopping list? So we've got, uh, you know, out of those hundred species which we house every single one of those species is according to our species plan has to serve a purpose of some to be sort in captivity to be there because one of the big things about a modern zoo is we don't want to just have things for the sake of having them it's not about having the biggest and best showing of birds mm -hmm. for everyone to come and look at everything's certainly got to have a reason and certainly one of the one of the biggest challenges we face as a as a private charitable organization is resources and trying to resource these programs where it's not just birds it's also reptiles and mammals and 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 a whole range of taxa so we've got to be very selective about what we have why we have it and and that role can be an advocacy role it can simply be that having that animal in a really nice setup tells a really important story to our visitor yep. about a habitat and so for example mallee fowl on site at adelaide zoo tell the story of the mallee habitat mallee fowl on site at monato zoo were off exhibit breeding and yep. so they serve a different role but also our mallee fowl at adelaide for a very long time had a live camera set up above their nesting mound which was a partnership we had with the recovery team so that people could see an, an active nest live. And so there's a, a huge variety of ways that these animals serve a purpose. But in terms of like the species that are up and coming, certainly, so swift parrots is a big one. Swift parrots are, as we know, they're critically endangered. They, they need all the help that they can get. And so certainly one of the, one of the biggest benefits of the orange belly parrot program has been that now with the relationships we've got in that network it's been acknowledged that we don't want to get to the point we got to with orange belly parrots before we set up an active insurance population in that space and so working with our partners with with that species is in the process of being upgraded to a managed species but before that occurred we've been supporting research in that space so we've been We've long had a very large group of swift parrots at Adelaide Zoo. Um, and so we've worked with researchers from um, ANU's Difficult Bird Research Group. Yep. And they've come in and done... With, with the good Dr. Swift Parrot, no doubt. Yes, yes. <laughs> they've come in and done um, 
tracker trials on our birds. So basically wearing the satellite trackers in a controlled environment so that they can test how it affects an animal's ability to deal with its environment so that they can feel comfortable to put it on an animal in the wild. Um, we're about to do the same thing with regent parrots. It's something that we've done before with regent parrots, but we're about to do it again. The same with black wing stilts. So our black wing stilts served exactly the same purpose on a banded stilt trial. So they were using our black wing stilts to test the tracking equipment on banded stilts. And then palm cockatoos is another great one. They're a species that we've housed at Adelaide since the early 1900s. But since the 1990s, we've been the only place in the country where you could see palm cockatoos in Australia on a, in, in a, a care setting. And we've had the only chicks hatched in human care in the country since the 70s at, at Adelaide. Um, and so, again, a lot of people would question them, what's the purpose? Why, why have, you know, if you've only got, and the reality is at the moment, there's less than 10 in human care in the country. If you have numbers like that, what's the point? Um, and from our perspective, with those animals, we've been able to document husbandry techniques, refine incubation techniques, refine rearing techniques, refine double clutching, refine nutrition, so that if now that they've been upgraded to an endangered species, if it's ever required, we've got all the information ready to go. So we don't have to test techniques with, you know, brand new founder birds that are a key part of an insurance population. I'm not saying that at the point that's our intention. We've just got it there should we ever need it. Yeah. Um, and again, then supporting research. So we supported um, a facial recognition software trial with palm cockatoos that enabled them to identify individuals in the wild just through photographs rather than catching and tagging and so we we're able to do that with our birds as a control um, as well as cognition so there's a lot of there's a lot of varying prongs to how an animal in our care kind of helps and i i certainly take your point about you know certainly it's it's similar in essence to caring for animals in human care is the same whether you're a zoo or whether you're a person at home with a finch ovary um but certainly some of the species we're working with are species which are facing challenges in the wild because they are specialized in a certain area or they require a certain food or weather pattern and so having them in in, in our care where we're able to pull our resources as a as a region work with universities academics to to really nut this stuff out it gives us the best chance to to succeed long term with conservation goals which is which is the the goal at the end of the day i mean speaking for myself personally um i would i would dream of the day and so i say this as well this is a personal opinion i would dream of the day where a zoo didn't have to exist um and the reality, unfortunately, is that I can't see that world currently, certainly for a long time into the future. And so, you know, I would that's, wonder even that's even if every one of your pro programs was a runaway success, unless we're going to give the world back to to the wild environment, that world's never going to ex exist again because people uh, people know now through mass media and mass communications they know about all the animals the birds the plants mm -hmm. the fish that are in the are in the world they can't possibly go and see them all but they still mm -hmm. want to see them so there's always going to be a point uh, a, a, sorry a a um demand for a zoo as a collection as a sightseeing opportunity and, Certainly, and and, yeah. and and the best outcome is to marry that with all of the research and yep. opportunities uh, and the demand that that is needed, because you can do a lot of study in a non-invasive way in a zoo that you mm -hmm. can't do in the wild, that you can pick Certainly. up this the same kind of information um, for things like blood typing and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's easy to. It's easy to do that with birds that are used to being handled than trapping mm -hmm. birds that haven't been handled or fish. It's or certainly true. Or whatever. Yeah. 
I think so, I think where it would change, and this is like even what we've seen in zoos in around the world in terms of you know good accredited zoos over the last two decades, what they're what they're keeping and what we're showing to the public has shifted. Yep. So even what? though there's certainly a demand there for people who want to get out and see wildlife, would we ever see a world where the Adelaide City site, for example, ever had an elephant again? No. No. Um, and, but... and, and that's where zoos have really come a long way in that they have they have taken each one has sort of taken a, a direction with a specialty and they've mm -hmm. uh, really improved their knowledge and their capability to display. Uh, and you would think that with the, the appropriate displays, that's reducing stress levels on, on mm -hmm. the animals nowadays. So uh, zoos have really come a long way from, from when I was a kid. And, and there are a couple of, ele you know, a handful of elephants in a tiny little enclosure at mm -hmm. Melbourne. And I remember seeing the, the old enclosure at Taronga, which was, you know, must have been must have been hell before they uh, they upgraded that. Now, Chad, I, I just want I to take oh yeah, sorry, I just want it. to take the opportunity to say thank you, Dr. Nick, for the for the uh, thumbs up. Uh, those of you who are in the Peanut Gallery, and there are some of you, feel free to leave a comment, uh, suggest a question, anything that I'm not covering, because no doubt there'll be a lot that I don't cover, because because we're, we're definitely having a bit more fun than normal tonight. Uh, Chad, um, you're a herper as well. So let's let's talk a Guilty. bit about um, uh, the, the Western Swamp Tortoise and yeah. that captive breeding program that you were involved in. Um, I, I know nothing about it, so fill me in. So Western Swamp Tortoises are a pretty amazing species. They were the, at one point, the most endangered species of reptile in the country. So that, that title has since been pipped and has now gone to another species of turtle um, in, uh, in New South Wales, another river, a particular river specialist. Um, but in terms of the Western Swamp Tortoise, so it's a program that Perth Zoo spearhead, and we're lucky enough to work with them on that as a species, they're interesting in a multitude of ways. They're a, they're a summer estivator. So their estivation occurs through the summer months rather than the winter months, unlike most species of freshwater turtle in our country. Now, and, now, ju now just pretend I don't know what estivator is. Uh, so an estivation is basically a form of hibernation or torpor. Okay. It's just another another term for it. Um, yep. And they do that through the summer months in leaf litter rather than in winter. But for them, it's, it's about, um, it's about uh, rainfall. So where they live, they live in these um, seasonal ephemeral wetlands that were around the Perth area. Um, and so winter is when they're full of water and so therefore food. So that's when they're active. And then they actually rest in the summer months. Now they're, they're interesting because of that. They're interesting, though, then because how much their habitat has a changed because of development um, and also rainfall patterns. Has rainfall that patterns. been the main the, the main um, cause of their decline? That just well, the, the the land use changes in part, around it, it, Perth. It's partly that. It's partly that, but it's also because where they live, they didn't have any natural predators. So their response to something okay. different is, oh, what's that? And they'll just literally swim yeah. towards yeah. it. And so a yeah. fox or a pig or a cat yeah. just goes, sits there and the food, it's like Uber Eats for them. Um, but for them, that's been that, that in partnership with habitat change or loss has been the biggest issue. But with Western Swamp Tortoises, Thankfully, that program in terms of breeding and releasing has been very successful over the last um, five to 10 years and has got a self-sustaining, increasing wild population in partnership with a self-sustaining, increasing population in human care. Um, and so the biggest issue now is just managing the habitat and making sure that the habitat's going to be there and continue to be there long term. And as rainfall patterns shift and change, I mean, that's going to be something that 
we're going to have to deal with with a lot of habitats. Um, but as a species, they're certainly from a population level going in the right direction. So our involvement in Adelaide is purely we we housing them, breeding them, and then animals that we breed travel back to Perth after two estivation cycles in Adelaide, and then they get released back to the wild over in Perth. Um, one of the reasons we do that, because a lot of people would ask, for example, like if Perth are doing it, why would Adelaide do it? One of the reasons that we like to do that is because when caring for animals in human care, you can't, if your whole population is centralised in one location, like in one captive facility, you have to kind of view it in the same way that if you had one pocket of wild habitat in the wild, and if something happens to that pocket, so say there's a horrific fire or a natural disaster or a, even a potential disease outbreak or that's not familiar with, if everything's in the one spot, you then don't have a true insurance population. And so having yes, your can, population spread out is important. Because uh, we can talk about noisy, uh, noisy scrub birds and western ground parrots and Mally emu wrens to be thinking about that. I mean, Mally emu wrens obviously aren't that as limited, but yeah. those threats are real nowadays. So um, They certainly are, and as habitat becomes more fragmented, it's going to be an issue that we face more and more in the coming, you know, 20 to 30 years. And if you, the, the good thing is, is that we're getting far better in this country in general and as an industry in terms of the zoo industry at acting proactively on those concerns to kind of prepare rather than reacting to a crisis that's already occurred so i think i think it's looking better in that sense but it's still a long way to go chad while we were talking and you're talking about managing habitat and whatnot there something just came to mind um and this is again sort of a bit bit of an in not an in joke but an in thing um today i released an episode for the podcast uh which featured sally bryant who is the chair of the 40 spot part uh, recovery team and they're and they're in the process of updating a recovery plan which was um last produced in 2009 now, you in 2021 were, were, were the chair of the OBP recovery team. Now, after I put Sally's episode out, I got a comment on YouTube and I've just brought it up. I'm going to put it up and read it out. And I responded straight away to it with, with some comments. I, I want to kick this around with you because this, I think, goes to a bit of a preconception. And before we turn the, the recording on, I was talking about, I'd always assumed that nearly all the captive breeding was funded mostly by government in some way, the departments. But you said that Zoos SA is a totally non-government, non-profit. So I'm going to ask you later how much government money goes in, but let's get this up and see if we can read it. So um, Chris has said, uh, as a response to what Sally and I talked about, so many of these threatened species recoveries teams are failing to do their job. The survival of these species is their responsibility. Um, the last 40 spot part of late recovery plan was, you know, expired in 2010. What have they been doing for the last 10 years? And uh, what have I said? I, I, I think they would universally say it's pretty hard to do much without funding. I know the 40 spot team uh, are in the process of, re of renewing the plan now. You can't really update a recovery plan if there's no money for monitoring or new surveys. Hopefully the next decade will not be a disaster um, that the last one was. I'll eagerly await the updating and uh, I think I just said, let's hope for, hope for the best. Now, you've sat in the chair for a recovery team and yep. and that team that you were um, the head of for that period is one of the icon species, one of the glamour species. Everyone wants to talk about the orange-bellied parrot. But 
Um, do you think the criticism is fair? Like I, I took umbrage to the to to Chris saying that it was their responsibility, the recovery teams. The recovery teams are just a bunch of scientists and and conservationists. The responsibility, in my view, is the government's, because because either either the First Nations people own the wildlife or the government owns the wildlife, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I yeah, I I think the responsibility of a recovery team is an interesting one. Um, each it's a really, recovery team... It's a vexed it's, issue, it's, isn't it? Like, but, it is. But, but but the view in the public, which is what I was interest, interested in, is that um, I, don't know, I don't know where we got it wrong with the whole threatened species recovery hub and the commissioner and the, the, mm-hmm. the whole thing, that people who are obviously well-meaning and care would then be blaming people like you and Sally for what is going wrong, which is totally off track, in my view. I, I think the reality of recovery teams is recovery teams are a... It's it's like saying... Look, they're, they're broad. And the reality of recovery teams in Australia is, is there's no actual... So you can be an accredited or an approved recovery team by the federal department, um, but any anyone, if they really wanted to, could put a bunch of stakeholders together into a room and start calling themselves a recovery team. Because whoever so, got the money, whoever was able to raise the money would be able to say, we are the team, aren't we? Because certainly. they would be doing the work. Certainly. So, but there is a, and, there is a, there is actually an, a, a, a process, yeah. A and process to be officially group. endorsed. I, I, yeah. I, I, I understand um, that. But, but what, what I, I just want to ask you this. I'll put you on the spot here. Yeah. If you're if you're the the chair of the recovery team for the yellow bellied sap sucking pigeon leg parrot, right, the chances are that your job is a lecturer in in ecology, or that you are the manager of of X program in X government department, and mm-hmm. that you do the recovery team work for nothing. Mm-hmm. That that the position might get you a seat. But you're not you're not paid on the recovery team to run the recovery team, are you? Certainly not. So, so in terms of those roles, those roles are the organisations who decide they're a stakeholder and have a chair, you know, have a chair on the team. Basically, donate some of their resource to, to the recovery team to put someone on the team. So certainly, that's where the so, communications have got wrong, haven't they? I, I, oh, I certainly. That, and I think, yeah. I think, basically, to me, a recovery team is a is a guiding. The way I look at a recovery team is a recovery team is a is a central location of stakeholders or people who've got a knowledge in the space. Yep. So at skills. least, exactly. So at least have a focal point or at least some get-together of those minds on a regular basis to talk about the issues facing a species. Are they all funded? No. No. Do they all have access to the same amount of money? No. No. Um, Is it dependent on... It's dependent on grants. It's dependent on... So, for example, the orange Belly Parrot recovery team has a, a small amount of money that is allocated to a part-time coordinator role, which basically helps us administer the program. So, you know, that program being a big glamour species, as you refer to it, um, requires a lot of reporting to lots of different bodies. And there's a lot of working groups within the recovery team. And so, for example, myself, when I was chairing, so I was was, um, in an interim position for um, just almost 12 months between an official chair being elected. So generally the chair position is actually held by someone from a government department. And at the time the previous person had gone past their tenure in the role and there wasn't anyone else able to at that point step into the role and my organisation was happy to support it. So we did it for 12 months. 
but at that point I was wearing the hat as a recovery team chair, which also then you chair the species SACG, which is a smaller group of um, specific knowledge sets in the recovery team, which and meet S more regularly. SAGP stands for? The Species Advisory, Advisory Program Group or something. Okay. I forget the P. Um, but it's basically the recovery team votes on key, big, broader things. And then the SACG, um, SACG has got um, the key academics, the key um, government department representatives, and then the chairs of the other subgroups, which are the captive management group, which is the group within the recovery team of all of the organisations that keep orange belly parrots in care and breed them, but also um, anyone in relation to genetic work that's managing the program. Then there's also a veterinary, a veterinary technical reference group, which manage wildlife concerns in care and in the wild. And, and then and there's they, other working groups. And does does that group, the, the vet group, do the, do the genetic work as well? No, is so it, that was that generally occurs under the captive management group. Okay. Um, so in that field, in that those groups of roles, you know, at one time as chair of the recovery team, I was sitting on all four of those groups. So you're meeting pretty regularly with people when you're writing reports and you're writing articles and you're writing minutes and, you know, the realities of being a chair of, an, of a group like that is mostly writing minutes and and checking in on actions, um, plus my other hats that I wear and other zoo organisation bodies, and then my day-to-day -day role at supervising a team of people and, and on the ground with birds. All of this is done generally out of people's sincere goodwill. passion and goodwill for yeah. these species. Yeah. And that includes, I will say, that includes the people who work for the government departments involved in this. Oh, um, absolutely. They're doing extra hours to get this work done because, yeah. because they're still putting signs up at the National Park or wherever it is that they're, they're yeah. also working. They're still cleaning the toilets and all that yeah. stuff in their, in their normal I, job. What I, what I certainly, my view on threatened species and whose responsibility it is, is that to me, it's everybody's responsibility. It's the community's responsibility. It's but... the community's responsibility. It's the government's responsibility. It's business. It's individual stakeholders. It's everybody. And the reality is right. when you look at successful programs or what you would mark as a successful program is when everybody involved has really owned it. So for I, I look, for example, at Regent Honey Eaters to me, I know their population is still not where we'd like it to be, but you look at the ownership that the local communities in that area have over that program, the people, the school kids who really love that program and own or, and own Regent Honey Eaters as their bird and they they champion it. It's become then an election issue in their area, so then your politicians become aware of it. It well, becomes that's what it needs. It's all it pervasive. needs to be. Yeah. It needs to be that on a local level. Regents is really interesting. Mm. Now, uh, tell me, is is Monato situated in Regent Honey Eater um, habitat? Like, is it suitable Historic. at Monato? Yeah, historic. historically, okay. So, and then into um, into the Adelaide Hills, they were found too. They were found all the okay, way down yeah, into the Adelaide yeah. Hills. And and uh, so, my, so he, uh, I know I said this to you earlier on before we um, before we press the button. And I guess uh, regular listeners will have heard me bleating on about this kind of stuff all the time. My concern with region honey eaters, and I think they're the really absolutely dead set urgent Australian one at the moment is in South Australia, are they still allowing suitable habitat for Regent honey eaters, whether it's private land or public land, to be cleared? Do you know that? I cannot, know that? that I cannot answer. I don't so know that, the answer to that question. So the, the, this, is, this is where my... 
my really obvious problem as an outsider is mm -hmm. if if we've got recovery teams that everybody is doing their best to to mm -hmm. keep these species viable isn't the first thing that government of of any color persuasion or whatever if they're serious they've got to stop the habitat being knocked down you know the there's a lot of focus on koalas and habitat mm -hmm. but Region honey eaters are the ones who are going to lose out first and biggest. And the idea that we might still have two tractors and a chain knocking down habitat for, for one, of, one of the ones that is teetering on the brink to put wheat or soybeans or whatever in the ground or to have cows poo on it is just, to me, is insane. And, and, and the whole idea of directing money into these programs, shouldn't we be buying this sort of marginal farm? Marginal country can be returned to, to habitat mm -hmm. if, we, if we had this coordination. So my, my frustration is, and I'm, I invite you to vent, <laughs> why is it that we can get all of the stuff coordinated and all these bodies and all these funding groups and foundations and everyone all to get together on 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 the hard stuff the hard stuff of understanding the creatures breeding them setting up the the right environment in captivity but we can't coordinate to stop the stuff happening and i don't say that we have to tell farmers we're going to take your livelihood off you you can't do that why don't we just buy the bloody property Give them a, a return. Maybe we have to pay a premium to get it, but isn't it worth it? Why can't we coordinate that? There's my frustration, it's, mate. <laughs> it's it's a good, it's a very good question, and I think um, it, it should go hand in hand. The way the way we should view it go hand in hand. Now, now personally, for example, I don't sit on the region honey eater recovery no, team no, no, myself. No. I know, I know but, I'm taking you out of school, uh, but oh no, no, but no. The, I think, but the, but the issue is there for all of these, all of these. Certainly, creatures, I think, you know? I think where it fits into me is where it becomes. You've got a, you've got a resource base which is limited, and it just, it is. Even if you had all the funding in the world, research and all of the above is very expensive. Um, so, for example, like orange-bellied parrots, I would say at the moment, the funding that goes into the recovery team supports research and certainly the infrastructure for releases and so on. But at the moment, all the captive breeding work that goes on, testing in relation to that transport costs, the vast majority of that occurs at the organisation's own expense. That, so that doesn't even come out of recovery team funds. That Most of the time, there are some ex examples where um, funding will be allocated in a grant for a specific project, but mostly we're doing that out of the general operations of Zoo South Australia, for example. Yeah, yeah. And but for, if you've got a... Sorry. If oh, I, no, I was going to... I, I was just grinning because, the, I mean, every time I speak to someone, it, the, the battle for funding is never ending. Oh. And, and, but then we've just given 40 billion away to um, companies that didn't need it. I think it was 15 billion that they've given away to schools that didn't need it. And we've spent, we don't even know how many billion on submarines that we're never going to get, but we can't find a couple of million, you know, mm. that, well, so that's where certainly it comes back to the community, doesn't it? We've got yeah. to force the, we've got to force the issue. Certainly. I, I will say that the new, the new um, fund that was opened up that was accessible to recovery teams, for example, and the, and the species that made the, the 100 priority, the recent yeah, 100 the, the, priority the, listing, which is Every been, time I see that Channel 9 show where it goes, the 100, I think. The 100. That's what I think of. The, the listing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was certainly a welcome, a welcome access to money that we've, we've been able to get access to or apply for. I think resourcing is always going to be a tricky one. I think yeah. what it comes down to for me, though, is, for example, Regent Honey Eaters. Your biggest issue at the point that the program was established was just the population. It was based on the population. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah. relevant 
irrelevant of what was going on as to what was triggering it in the wild, we didn't even have enough in care yeah, we, that it that it mattered. We, you could have we came to, we got to the game too late. You know, yeah, we were fifteen and years so, behind where we needed to 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 get into it. So when the no, when the program, no one like thought that, it would get that bad, did it? Well, no. the two things: no one thought it would get that bad, and two, there hadn't been enough money put into monitoring. Because it's yeah. been guys like Ross and Dean who have doing and Chris and doing stuff off their own bat for for twenty years because they're really keen bird watchers. That was the information we had. We sh- we didn't have yeah. people and teams out there scouting all over three and four states when when it was needed. When I was in my twenties, yeah. you know, that was when it was needed. The, the reality is, though, is that when that becomes then your key issue, unfortunately, what that means is, is that gets all your resources. So therefore, if your bigger if your bigger issue then becomes why is the species in reduction, which it always is going to be, then you're always going to be coming to that after addressing just the population level. So yeah. with any of the species where we've been able to get to it beforehand, the work can be done ahead of time. So I look at um, cassowaries, for example. Cassowaries, to me, is a really great example of work that was done um, through the recovery team and birds in human care um, under the guise of um, uh, James Biggs, who's now the Director of Conservation at um, the Zoo and Aquarium Association. Wonderful guy. He was my manager when I worked at Camps Tropical Zoo. And during that time, and I certainly won't speak for his work or take any credit for it, but the work that he did at working with James Cook University on road fatalities and so on has, and then communi- working with the community has led to all of those organisations getting successful corridors put in place, bridges built over highways. There's, there is so much getting done in that space, which has meant that the sheer numbers on the ground is not the issue that we need to focus on necessarily. We're actually able to do that preventative work in terms of habitat protection. The key is is where where that where that focus needs to be. And if we got to the part, if we get to the program when we just need bums on seats, it just by default means that your your habitat base then is going to be reduced by the time you get there. So yeah. unfortunately, it's just how we deal with that. And the, the, the far north Queensland community have really adopted the needs of the cassowary and are now living around them rather than mm-hmm. uh, rather than saying, right, this is how it is. Cassowaries have to fit in. Uh, yeah. It, it, it well, I look, at, me... I, look at, um, I look at the southeastern red-tailed black cockatoo. That's yeah, a project that's a, that we've been we were beauty, working on it? at Zoos SA. We've been working with the local community in that part of the world, providing expertise for surveying and, and funding for tree planting and so on. But the reality is, is that is a group of, that is a local community owning a project that has resulted in a successful turnaround of a species. Now, it's certainly not done. There's still a long way to go, but it's going in the right direction thanks to the ownership of a community and again it's become a political issue in that area it's and through their work as a community that species has got a future we're able to work with that community on a species like that but if you don't have good advocates for those species and that's again I, I look at the recovery team a lot as that recovery teams need to be good advocates for species too and that's where you know having having good communications people so it's a skill set that i think we need to address more broadly in the ecological community having people who are good at communications good at marketing good at this stuff actually out there telling these stories as well or talking about the good work that happens it is important because we're in a very competitive market in terms of trying to get people's attention yeah. and when yeah. cost of living's going up and all of the above if you say well actually no i need your support for this parrot that's the size of a budgie 
you really have to have planted a seed to that person that they care about them for that to succeed. Do you remember? Do you remember when uh, Jeff Kennett called them the trumped up Corella? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was well. The, I, that, 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 that was when the when the wind farm issue was uh, was happening. You know. Um, yep. So it, it there's always pressures on the, the there's always going to be a commercial imperative for somebody a commercial interest for somebody to ensure that we don't do anything because there's always there's always a resource that somebody wants to exploit that the bird or the turtle or the fish need mm-hmm. so that's always a battle that needs to be done so uh, the there's two points I, I want to take up. The mallee fowl, I reckon I haven't dug into it as much as I as uh, I No should. pun intended. No, but the <laughs> but it seems to me that the recovery team and all of the community groups in uh, across three, perhaps four states, have really got coordinated now. And if climate change really affects the mallee fowl, I think we're ahead of the curve in terms of being proactive and mm-hmm. ensuring a viable population for that bird. And that's really encouraging that a lot of the lessons seem to have been learned mm-hmm. and that and that the skills that people have learned in one area are now being transferred into other projects. So mm-hmm. so I get a real a really good feeling about that. We've just talked about cassowaries. Um it's not too long ago. Um, I think about the time I registered the domain for the bird emergency was 2013, 2014. I'd actually resigned myself to the orange-bellied parrot being like the Norwegian blue. An ex-parrot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the team, you know, down at Malaluka and then everybody in all the other locations have done a smashing job. I mean, really, the fact that I think I'm pretty confident without knowing, without any of the inside uh, game, it looks like we might have we might have turned the corner, and we, without a without a natural disaster afflicting the the wild population now, it seems like you guys have all worked out how to do the introductions and to make them to get that, that migration, that first migration to be uh, successful mm-hmm. and that those populations, provided we can keep the habitat for them, that they'll mm-hmm. be viable going on into the future. So that's a win. Let's mm-hmm. class that one as a win. Um, what's your gut feeling about Swifties? Are they going to adapt to... Um, to breeding in captivity? Well, Swifties, I mean, unlike orange belly parrots, Swifties have been kept in human care and in aviculture for many, many, many years. And so in terms of breeding Swifties in human care, it's not so much actually the issue, which in some ways is a good thing. Like I feel confident that when, when, as a program it's established and we start needing to produce animals and and managing animals i don't see that being a concern because like certainly from our perspective we've been breeding swifties at adelaide for you know 20 30 years they've been very actively kept in the in the private sector for a very long time so i don't it's not so much with swifties um is breeding them in care and i guess that's the good thing it's like swifties we can we can breed them we know we can breed them and there's a good reservoir of genetics in in the in the private collections so that you could swap individuals and all that to keep that you're not going to be down to a couple of a couple of hundred uh yeah distinct genetic identities so yeah, we're in a better position certainly with Swifties than we were with OVPs by the time the program started. I think the the benefit of Swifties is is we can learn the lessons from OVPs, what works, what doesn't, um, and basically be on the front foot with all that other habitat work that I was talking about yeah. in partnership with a 
with a captive breeding program that allows for building numbers and releasing um, to support it. And I guess that's the good thing about Swifties is that we're in a, a better position. Are we in a good position? No, because at any point, if you've got a critically endangered animal, you're not in a good position. Um, do I feel quietly confident about Swift parrots? I do. I feel like we're not coming to the party as late. In saying that, though, OBPs weren't in as a terrible position 30 years ago, you know, when a when a recovery team was formed originally. Yeah, no. But that's it's, also it's really because that we're 15, still... It's that sort yeah. of 15 to 10 years ago time where, where, where so much of the the breeding and the and how to release them hadn't really been solved but but that, yeah but that seems to have been uh been done so well I mean, certainly certainly we've had positive results like seriously positive results the last two seasons in comparison to the previous decade and yeah. like for me the fact that i used to stand up and do talks for volunteer groups and stakeholder groups and like I, I i i wasn't at the point where i was like they're done but you know i i was saying at one point we're not going to see an orange belly parrot in south australia for decades is yeah. what i was saying and yeah. then last year one popped up they on the Kurong. turned up yeah I'm... like at that point i was happy to eat my words because it was a really exciting moment but it's it's also you know, it, it's then on us and it, and it is something that we take seriously. And the great thing about that program is the people involved are super passionate about the work yeah. that you, you, whatever that's we where I did, wanted, That's where I wanted to go just for a minute too, yeah. is to talk about, um, or just to really recognise those people who have been long-serving participants at Malaluka. You know, talking people who have been doing work some with a little bit of recompense but basically people giving up their time for 30 years 35 years some people not as long obviously but yeah that's committed it's, that's people really really committed to the cause and you know we've got to celebrate them we've got to yeah, celebrate it's, them it's a hard slog and i mean and they're the invisible people too Chad, they're not on the recovery team and their names aren't on any published articles and whatnot, but they're the ones slepping around with buckets of feed and, and wiping down feed tables and, and wiping down aviaries and, and whatnot. So, you know... I, oh, certainly our, our work wouldn't be possible without volunteers and the people who do. Like, you know, I, I, I come and I get to talk to you, but... Even in my own organisation, I've got a whole team of people who yeah, yeah. are out there working with OVPs day to day to day. And again, you know, like we, we do, there's a, it's it's by no small feat that these things happen. There are hundreds of people who work on this project. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the reality is, is that three years ago, I had, and you know, Adelaide Zoo is one of the smaller holders of the species, certainly in comparison to some of the bigger facilities. Um, but we would still every year have more on site at Adelaide than we're in the wild hmm. at, at the start of the breeding season. And to go from that to, you know, the levels that we're seeing now of population return, but also leaving in less than five years, it's, it's very exciting. Is it? Are we out of the woods? Certainly not. No. Yeah. Again, do I feel quietly optimistic? Yeah. And yeah. I think mainly because we've really, I feel like the team has really pinned down on the releases that are most effective, the techniques involved in that, but also the research that's gone into it, the work that um, the ANU Difficult Research Group yeah. has done yeah. with Difficult Bird Research Group has done in partnership with Depipui and, um, sorry, NRE in Tasmania now and DELP in Victoria and then all the other organisations that have supplied data. That work is priceless and it's, it's, it's helped it's, us in our jobs constantly. So, you know, we, we're very lucky. And, and so many of the lessons that have been learned 
with the OBP can now be applied to other species that require a number of states and a number of different um, NGOs as well as governments mm, getting totally. together and and following a process. So, so it's a good news story um, for that. I mean, I, I I just don't think people understand how much um, how much time is donated to the cause because the like the difficult birds group they're all doing their other academic stuff they're still publishing papers on everything else that they've got to keep doing to get other grants and to keep employed and then they're doing all the all the recovery team work and feeding in information doing surveys you know checking nest boxes picking off mites you know all the I just, I just wish that. I mean, that's why I do. That's why I do the show is so that the public mm. can understand that it's not a bunch of people sitting in Spring Street or what, what, what's the yep. relevant street in in Adelaide where, where when you're talking about state politics, what like in in Sydney it's or North, Street, North Terrace, North, North Terrace. Terrace. It's all those people in North yep. Terrace stuffing it all up. You know, it's. It's just not like that. There's a pot of money. You all have to compete for it. It's yeah. never enough. Um, good projects. But we out. get it done. Yep. We, we, we get right? it done. and That's right. And you get it done off your own back. You know, well, I've, um, got to, I've got to acknowledge, in, you know, I've got, to, I've got to publicly acknowledge, for example, the work of Carolyn Hogg, who oh, works definitely. out of Sydney. Yep. And the OBP program in Captain in human care, the work that we've been able to do on that population where we've got such a robust population where we can release a hundred, comfortably release a hundred birds a year um, now is all off the back of her work. Her work yeah. on, on understanding the genetics, how we could best manage it. She's been basically donating her time to help the species coordinator and, and stud book keepers as part of the and for it's been years. amazing. Yeah, yeah. For years and years. And, and it's people like that who, you know, even the roles of species coordinator and stud book keeper, um, Lisa Tuttle and Ash Herod over at Moonlit Sanctuary, again, they're voluntary positions that organisations provide the resource for. And then, you know, my chair roles were the same. And it just wouldn't, it wouldn't work without that goodwill. But the passion as well. And in a way, it drives results though as well because the people who are there aren't there because I'm being paid to sit on this committee. They're no, no, there no. because it's, they love and those species. And it's to get the outcome. The exactly. outcome is the important thing. So, hey. Exactly. Cheers to you lot. You know, good on you. <laughs> um, I, they're a, I they're an amazing bunch it. of people. Yeah, I certainly appreciate it. I mean, I, I just get to sit here on my ass and... And, and talk to people about it. Um, uh, I I really wish, I, I just wish we could find an easier way to communicate to the public that, um, that most of the conservation work that goes on is unpaid volunteer work. Because, because even though people are doctor such and such or you know, mm -hmm. professor such and such. Most of the conservation work is work they do extra to what they're paid to do. And that's mm -hmm. where the volunteer stuff comes in. It's like being, it's just like being the footy coach of the under 11s, you know. Yep. Um, well, certainly the lack of, the lack of understanding of most people in terms of how even the scientific community works and funds itself. Um it boggles my mind like more yeah, people should understand what it's like to write a grant to pay to pay your way and so on and it's something yeah. which none of none of the organizations working in this space are exempt from we all have to go through this That's but sure. it's just it's it's and it's and it's there for a reason and for whatever reason it is that's the system we have so we you know we work within it uh, but, but i wish but people the, but the more reason, people understood you know, it get, 
can I pull you pull you up there, Chad? Too because yeah. it, I, I I feel a little bit like we've all been conditioned to this to <laughs> a great condition of swallowing bullshit. That we've all been conditioned to this. The competitive grants they're all there for a reason. It's to stop waste and to make sure that mm-hmm. the public money is used effectively. So that's at this end, and at the mm-hmm. other end, we're pissing away billions of dollars into the hands of bloody billionaires you know it's just it so we've been conditioned to accept that here's your shit deal chad now here's your shit grant Uh, appreciate it and love me for giving it to you that's and that's just it's just wrong and that's because we do not value the wildlife and the habitat it's all a part of the uh, part of the process, we value mm. the farm, but we don't value the the, the timber that stands on it, right? Mm-hmm. And if we don't value well, the I mean, timber, Matt... we can't value the lizards or the insects, you know. Mm-hmm. Which is well, to me, the, it's to me map. that whole thing as well. In essence, is a communications and marketing issue. That's right, and it really That's is. Right. That's it right. really and, is. It's how do we? How do we? And we're seventy years behind. We're probably a hundred years behind in terms of that because because the uh, the value the intrinsic value in Australian society to conquering the bush you know carving out carving out a livelihood from the from a, a harsh country we're mm-hmm. conditioned to that the other way of looking at it is that we continue to stuff it up we continue to bugger up the place we live. And we continue mm-hmm. to kill the animals and the plants and the and the birds that rely on that patch of land. Um, one day, hopefully, it's in this next couple of this decade or two, we turn that around and we start to yeah. value th- the land as well as certainly. The certainly, one thing I'm very fortunate, I guess, for is the fact that I get to work in a space where I'm surrounded by the people who are passionate about that's it. And so that's something right, that's where. Right. You know, certainly, certainly my view of it, you know, I, I get to see, I get to see, you know, the people you reference, the, the people who don't get paid, the people who are doing it off their own backs. I get to see that drive and energy and passion that's out there, which is why, you know, I'm certainly not, I'm very much an optimist on the conservation front. Like I, I certainly, there are very few conservation battles, I think, on the planet that we've where an animal is still around, where we've lost the battle. Yeah, we, For me, there can, is always going to be an out, and it's just a question we can of win finding the way. We, yep. That's right. We, we've got the skills. If we don't have the knowledge, we have the ability to gain the knowledge. Mm-hmm. We, we've got the ability to understand the relationships between species and within species, all that kind of mm-hmm. knowledge we're able to get. It's mm-hmm. the, just the commitment to making it happen. That's where the battle ha- is still there. Um, certainly, and it's but it's also about how to make that. And it's certainly one of my biggest passions in my work. Is and that's where we're going next. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is well that was that was well timed of me, Ben. Um, okay. It's about communicating that to the people who don't know that that's happening, because the vast majority of people still haven't heard of an orange belly parrot. And you know that's a that's a concern for me. Yeah, How do we and, cross that bridge? I don't know, but it's it's that that to me that's that's why I'm so passionate about the public interaction side of the work that I do, because the the real win the win that we would get is the minute that yeah every single person just knows what they are in the same way that you know a koalas are a great example of this to me. Everyone knows koalas. They love koalas. And if you even talked about, and as has happened, if you talk about a future without koalas, it gets people on their feet ready to get out there and do stuff. It's a double-edged um, sword, though, because, you know, where I'm coming from in, you know, Nam or Melbourne, uh, mm-hmm. koalas, big-ticket item. Greater glider, not so much. And the greater glider, we're knocking down their habitat every day and 
and that's to secure a couple of dozen jobs, you know, mm-hmm. which to me is Looney Tunes. But that's because no one is out there going, gee, greater gliders, we love them, you know. Um, and that's that's certainly that to me is almost the biggest conservation issue it of is. awareness. The next yeah. fifty years, it's how do we make all the species? And the reality is, is do we go through as a community and highlight each habitat that's under threat and find the one species in that habitat that we can get interest in yeah. that will protect it, which yeah. is a strategy that works, yeah. or yeah. do we have to? go back to the drawing board as, as a community and, you know, get, really get good communications, marketing, spokespeople, even even to me, writers, good writers, people who can tell a bloody good story to, to get that interest and engagement involved because I just, I to me, that's the, that's the crux of it, I think. Well, I'm up to a Because koalas 85. have got a good story. I'm up to about 85 interviews now that I would love someone to turn those into a story for the website to, so mm. that it could get the SEO, you know, because that, it, um, I mean, look, it's got nothing to do with me. It's just so much work for that kind of stuff to happen. But I remember when I interviewed um, uh, Linda Bell, who uh, is the general manager of uh, Saving Our Species in, in uh, New South Wales, I think that strategy you identified about picking a habitat so that we we have a habitat and it, and and in de- and an intact location that mm-hmm. we can uh, designate to protect and that you then identify whether it be a waratah or a honey eater or a cockatoo or a turtle a turtle or a whatever a a, a, a betong or a you know, anti kindness, whatever it is that is in the locality that you can make the movie star. That's mm-hmm. that's sort of the approach that that may need to be taken because there's not enough resources to to tell the story of everyone. Um, yeah, but but people need to understand ecosystems, I think, better. Um, so that's part of the challenge, isn't it? That we have to. Uh, I I don't know if the web of life was still the biology textbook when you were at at high school, but that was what um, uh, volume one and two of the web of life for year eleven and twelve biology. Um, yeah, that's what we were being taught the interconnectedness of everything. Uh, I don't know enough young people who are going through that process anymore to know whether education is still focusing on that or whether we're teaching them to drive and. Um, mm-hmm. you know, about consent and respect and everything else, which is, it's all important. Um, I just don't know whether the focus is still, is still so there about the intrinsic connectedness of mm-hmm. all of all life. No. Certainly. I mean, when I went through school and I mean, in the scheme of things, it wasn't that long ago. It feels like a long time ago sometimes, it's only, but it's um, it was only yesterday, Sonny. It was only yesterday. <laughs> um, I it, it was certainly still part of curriculum. I can't speak for now. I mean, I've got I've got you know people on my team now who are can vote who were you know almost born after I started doing this job, which is terrifying. Um, but it's um, you know that's just the reality of it. But they um, they're still learning it. I, I is my understanding. I agree with you. I think the way the way we look at ecology certainly and how we communicate about it is important. But also then how we legislate and how we build policy framework around it too. Because if you're um, building policy framework around protect protecting, for example, just a breeding location, it doesn't then matter. If you've got the breeding location down pat, if the summer if the summer feeding ground or whatever that's, it is isn't also right. protected, and so understanding, and you know, like OBPs to me is a particularly complex program because of this, because we're crossing multiple jurisdictions, um, state jurisdictions, and so your policy frameworks differ. So how do you protect an animal? where multiple departments and different states and so you know we've got a framework that seems to work at the moment 
um, but it's complex. It is because nature doesn't recognise state lines, and so how, or even 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 government, you know, even country lines. There are plenty well, of species which. Well, let's not talk about seabirds or shorebirds, then, will we? Well, exactly. <laughs> it's know, like how do you how do you even cross that bridge? Because then, as well, what you how you vote as a person in your electorate here on your federal government might not even be the crux it's really hard that's right i don't that's have the right. answer it it, <laughs> it 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 might depend on uh, uh on siberia or korea or china exactly or taiwan or thailand or yeah you know, that's right i mean which which is why we can't give up, you know. It's, no. And and and, uh, and we have to just keep saying these things. Now, I just mm. want to butt in a, a bit and say, uh, the Facebook and the Twitch people, um, there's something you want to say or want me to ask or want Chad to respond to, um, stick it in the comments and uh, and let's go. Let, let let's go back to talk more about uh, about you, Chad. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, your live flight um, experience has taken you uh, beyond Australia mm-hmm. and you've done, as I mentioned earlier, over 3,500 uh, individual shows uh, in, in your time working at, as a keeper. Um, how, two things, two things I want you to, to tell everyone is... Where have you were, or where have you gone to present shows? Mm-hmm. And then, what do you think are the really important um, educational, uh, interpretive, communication parts of those shows? It's a, it's a great question. That second one. Um, but in terms of my career, so I started at the Taronga Free Flight Show. Um, so it was a goal of mine as a kid, as I spoke about earlier, to, to do that bird show. So, you know, I was I was very lucky because my industry is very competitive to get into. And the first job I happened to get was at the bird show that I actually wanted to present. That was like a career goal of me. Like I was, I, I, I don't even think I realised how lucky I was at the time. Like now I look back on it and I look at people trying to get into my industry and I'm like, I was, wow. Like it's, and I worked hard and I volunteered, but also I was in the right place. I had the right mentors on my side. I had good people who, you know, wanted me to succeed as well. And I got to do that, which was amazing. So I was there for 12 months. Then I um, moved to Cairns in far north Queensland and worked for a small family run zoo which is no longer there. It's cool. It was called Cairns Tropical Zoo. It was in, um, in Palm Cove. Um, so I got to live in Palm Cove for three years, which wasn't too bad. And um, <laughs> it was pretty relaxing, actually. How did um, the Botanic Gardens in, in, in oh, Flecker? Fantastic place. Stunning. Yeah. Um, and so I presented bird shows there. So we had a, we had a similar sort of species makeup of, of birds at the Cannes show. And then during that time, I got the opportunity to go over to the United States. And so while I was there, I was working for a company called Natural Encounters Inc., which is run by a gentleman by the name of Steve Martin, not the comedian, another guy. He's also very funny, but not the comedian. <laughs> and he, um, it's, a, it's a bird show animal training company, basically. So their existence is they subcontract animal presentations or animal training consultancies to zoos overseas. Um, and so I started at the um, bird show that's at the Disney at Disney Animal Kingdom, which is their, their zoo. We had a bird show there. And then we took a whole bunch of birds over to uh, Dallas in Texas, and we set up a bird show at the Texas State Fair, which is like their version of our agricultural shows, yeah. and which has we been did in every every uh, movie exactly that's, that's been set in the Midwest for forever. And it's a, it is as big as it it, it was terrifyingly big. Um, to put it in perspective, we were doing, and by the time I went there, I was there in the twenty fifth year of 
Steve's company doing this bird show there. Gee, gee. We had 90, 90 birds, um, just under 20 staff, and we were doing five to six shows a day with a amphitheatre that sat 5,000 people, and it was never an empty seat in the house across three and a half, four weeks. So that's taking birds to so many people. It is. It really is. Um, that's why I love what I do. Um, so following on from that, I did three years with marine mammals as well. So I did pinniped shows at Taronga working with sea lions um, and penguins before I came to Adelaide to do free flight again. Um, but it's why I love it because you are, you are taking these animals to people who may not even be on the fence. The reality is, is the vast majority of people who go to a zoo, go to an aquarium, go to a state fair, whatever it is, are still going to just have a fun day out. That's the reality of it. That's what we know from the research. And so these people are going for a good day out. So they may not even be on your side already. They may not even be on the side of thinking even conservation is important. They're happy to go to the zoo, but they're doing it because they were taken to the zoo when they were a kid by their parents. It's kind of what you do. So they're the people that we target because, and we've, we've got to get on board because they're the people really who are the missing link in this whole chain. It's the people who may not have even realised they have even the ability to do something about this stuff. Um, and so, you know, for me, I look at my own experience where I told you earlier about the macaw. For me, it was that one moment and here I am chairing a recovery team and, you know, so on later and it all stemmed from that moment. Sure, other things happened along the way. But the reality is, is I can do, we can do that exact same thing now for people. And, you know, I'm at the age now where there are people who work who have worked with me, who were kids who watched me do a show. Yeah, who I, have said, that was going to be my next question. How many how many disciples yeah. have you got on the team, you know, oh, that, have, well, that have come through from from everyone, that same experience in the amphitheatre? Every everyone who's at at works in a zoo has had a similar sort of experience. An interaction with an animal or with a person and an animal, and generally there's a person and an animal involved. There's someone who's inspired you. And that to me is unbeatable. You just, I, I look at, because I look at these shows and to me, and I use the word show and I don't shy away from the word show and I use the word entertainment and I don't shy away from it either because yeah. that's in reality what most people see it as. But I've got those people for 15 to 20 minutes. I have their undivided attention. And in that time, Short, they see a barking owl catch something in midair. They see a black breasted buzzard crack open an emu egg. They that, see that's something that I remember from that Taronga. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure, I couldn't be sure of my memory that it was a black breasted buzzard, but yeah, yeah. You see that, you see, you get an up close experience with a macaw. So we fly macaws in our show. Um, and during that time, if I can at least have them leave going, birds are cool, I'm happy yeah. because they're then the person that the next time they see a story on the ABC about the bird that they were interested in, that's a piece of research, you know, it's on a piece of research or something, they'll stop and think and watch it or even just read that article that they see that pops across their feet or whatever. That's the that to me is the key in what we do, and I I understand there's ethical dilemmas about keeping animals in human care, and particularly around I think people looking at animal shows still as purely entertainment. Um, Can I just stop you there? Yeah. Um. I I wanted to to note earlier on that that. I think this is a generational thing that I've always been referring to the birds in captivity and you're talking about the birds in human care. So yep. I think that is demonstrates a shift in the emphasis about 
where the animals are placed in the system. I don't mm-hmm. think that our hearts or our heads are different, but that where no. I, the time I grew up in, birds were in captivity. Now mm-hmm. we are caring for animals in our in our care, which is elevating their um, their position in the hierarchy, and that has got to be got to be celebrated. But before we press the go button, we were talking a little bit about the ethics of the show. Mm -hmm. And um, I shared with you something that I'll I'll share now. Um, uh, I'd been to the same Taronga show that you had about the same time, within the same handful of years. And I thought it was really, really well done. I really enjoyed it and and I couldn't see any problems. But I did go to one where I saw birds which I did, I thought were being, um, I felt like they were kind of trained pets rather than, mm-hmm. than animals being appreciated and certainly what they were being asked to do was pretty pretty poor. And then I went to another one, that, that was in Australia, then I went to another one overseas that part of it was really good and then, but then they went back to the, you know, sort of trained monkey kind of aspect of, of a lot of the stuff with parrots doing corny things, riding bikes and all that kind of stuff. And, mm-hmm. and, and I couldn't see any value uh, mm-hmm. that was educational and conservation focused in that part of the show. And that really mm-hmm. got me thinking about the value of them. But, mm-hmm. but I had an interaction with two hornbills and the keepers at that park took me back backstage. So I got I got to see all the breeding aviaries, and uh, they took me right through their their labs and their. I, I got I got a really good look, and it was great. But these hornbills were sitting on on me, and there was a uh, I can't remember which which kind of crow it was, um, just macaws. Mm-hmm. It was it was phenomenal. The immersive value for me, and I was already a bird nerd, and and that swung me back. And I thought, mm-hmm. well, if you're getting kids in a country where they see birds as something where you raid their nests, or you kill them because they're eating the crops or whatever, and that they then have a have a hands on, a really tactile experience, and and in your face, you know, eyeball to eyeball mm-hmm. experience with birds that they can actually see as sentient animals, intelligent animals, um, that that has value, that has intrinsic value in its in itself. So how do you pick a bird that is a species or an individual that that is suitable to be in a show like yep. this that... Um, that is not being exploited there's actually uh, it's actually a sort of a, a willing partner in the mm-hmm. in, 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 in the whole activity it's how a good you, it's a how do you do that it's a great question um and it's something that um steve martin the guy i was talking about earlier actually did a, a great presentation on a few years ago at a conference actually and a paper called the right tool for the job which i think sums it up perfectly um there's a whole multitude of factors that comes down to a what facilities do you have to keep your animal so for example if you don't have the facilities suitable to keep an eagle when you're not doing the show you shouldn't have an eagle in your in your presentation and if you, you want to have, have one, one in your collection you shouldn't have well one, full stop if you if you if you if you if you, if you want if you end up wanting to show that for example then you plan for appropriate facilities if you don't yeah. have it. Yeah. If you um, you then have to look at your setup, so your space where you're flying the birds, because as we know, bird flight is not bird flight. You can't get any bird to fly anywhere. There's a whole lot of factors that play into it. So, for example, at Taronga, beautiful amphitheater, but because the trees were so close up behind you on the hill. It meant that if the wind was coming anywhere from the south, uh, but the south, you had a reasonable kind of pocket of dead air around where the stage was. 
So you couldn't fly our peregrine falcons in the space when the wind was coming from any direction but the south. So they fl came out and flew when the wind was coming from the south. When the wind wasn't coming from the south, we used to take them off site every day to a park where they was higher up and they got good wind from all directions. So they'd still go out and fly. But that's a great example as well. If you've got wind pockets, for example, you can't then fly a bird that relies on consistent updrafts. So like for me, I feel uncomfortable with the idea of a pelican flying in a free flight show unless you've got a significant descent that the bird can make. So basically it's kind of a controlled glide down to a stage. It's not a takeoff to do the same thing thing going in reverse because the physics of their flight is just completely different yeah Let, let's talk for a minute about a peregrine falcon mm -hmm. um, how does a peregrine falcon come into into the collection and then mm -hmm. possibly into the show are they birds that have been rescued uh, or mm -hmm. some uh, like they've come in through some misadventure misfortune for the bird they they're not People aren't captively breeding uh, peregrines to go into bird shows, are they? I don't think at the moment. So I wouldn't say 100% that it hasn't happened in Australia before, but certainly the peregrines that I know of and the peregrines that I've worked with were all kind of non-releasable yeah. rehab jobs. So yeah. that so generally all, it was a... They've all it was been a shot or they've all... Yeah. Fought, been bird strike or something yeah, hit a car exactly. or something like that exactly okay. and so for whatever reason either the injury means that they can't physically function at full capacity yeah. in the wild or they spent so much time in care that they became too reliant on people and so yeah. they're not and, a and, that sound. and that's a similar situation for most of the birds that that will be in shows isn't it uh, they're all i would say all, from most I mean, of the large things like macaws raptors. and and some of the cockatoos and whatnot are probably different, but but yeah. yet, but a pelican will be one that's come in to 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 the zoo mm -hmm. for some kind of veterinary work or, or something, yep. and that then has not been able to be yeah um, certainly to be released and has a temperament that means they don't mind being a show off. So certainly that would be the case. So if you're getting a rehab animal in, so most, if not, I would say all but one of the wedge tails currently flying in programs across Australia were wild rehabs. There was one that was part of a clutch that hatched at Flays back in the day, um, who I, I worked with that bird when he was in Cairns. Um, so they, it, it has happened sporadically that a clutch will hatch in human care or um, and then they end up in a show. Generally, though, with those birds, it's a rehab case. But then as well, it's not any rehab is suitable. So, you, you know, you might have a bird that, for example, is completely missing a wing or um, temperament-wise just isn't suitable. And certainly one thing we've got to be very careful with is the messaging around yeah. animals with injuries, yeah. um, keeping animals like that, how you keep them. But from a temperament perspective, you have to have the right kind of bird. You have to have a bird that doesn't look at... And it's not so much about how they look at people because you can work on that. It's how they look. To me, what I look for is an animal that looks at change in, in stimuli and its an environment and how they deal with it. So if you've got an animal that sees a change in stimuli and its environment and it looks at it and explores it and kind of thinks about it, that's the bird that you want. So if, you, if you've got a bird that sees something different and straight away goes, nah, I'm out of there, that's generally a bird that I would avoid personally because the reality of working outdoors with these animals is I can't control what wild birds no, are going to fly they're, over. They're a flight risk, aren't they? Exactly. And, so you do. You've and, got to be very picky about that stuff, yeah. yeah. And and obviously, I, you know, I I make a, a joke about being a flight risk, but obviously, if a bird from captivity does take take fright and head off in the northeasterly direction, uh, never mm -hmm. to be seen again, the likelihood of it surviving is 
very, very, very low. It's pretty so, slim, but one so. thing I will say in the in on the fly off topic because it does happen. We've got your flying birds outside. Birds do occasionally take well, a wrong got, turn. You've, you've, you've got your uh, your macaw from Adelaide. Was was it the macaw that headed off yep. for a, a holiday for a few days? Three days. That was yep. about six years ago now. Yep. It happens, and so what we do in that context is you do a lot of work with them and you know a lot of people ask us how long it takes and the reality is it depends on the bird but before you go outside you're not just training the routine that you see in the show you train them flight skill i'm training them how to descend i'm training them how to land in a crosswind i'm training them how to fly in rain training them how to fly with predators nearby so alarm calls i'm training them how to fly uphill i'm training them how to go into their pet pack in every single different location that we need to so that if they end up in someone's backyard they'll walk into their pet pack in their driveway so there's a lot of background work that happens and then you know what it means is when those do occurrences do happen because they do you have an animal that can deal with lots of different weather conditions so it's flight fit and so it can handle being out but also the minute you it sees you comes back to you, puts itself away. And because of that, like I've been flying birds. I mean, you said how many shows I've done. And, um, I think about even just training sessions and individual birds, and I've never completely lost one. I've never had a bird that hasn't come back. We've always got them back, which is a pretty good stat when you think about the amount of flights that goes on. Well, I mean, um, if, so it's if you put the training and whatnot together, you must have done ten or fifteen thousand, probably, with individual probably. birds. So, probably. Uh, so to, to to not having lost one in battle is a is a pretty good pretty good stat. But um, yeah, you got to you got to pick the right one. And to uh, that as well, then there are species that then I would say that we do actively breed in human care if they're going to take part. So I would look at owls, for example. Owls so that, are a great that, example. Yeah, that, that's that's my ne- that's my next question. Who yep. who who are you using now? And when I say using, I mean who is who who are in the show? Who are the best ones? And how do you can, can you tell with a young bird of a suitable species that um, that has come into care by mm-hmm. whichever whichever method? Can you tell? Like, are you like the 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 bird flight show whisperer? <laughs> I I I I wouldn't go that far necessarily. I certainly I have a list of things that I like to see very quickly if I'm okay. assessing what a bird. Are, what are they? So definitely the the reacting to different stimuli is just number one. I want to see an animal that is interested by change, not terrified of not change. terrified okay um that's kind of starting i like an animal that's still physically fit even if they've got some form of injury because i i i just want to make sure that because flying daily in show is still physical work so we want to make sure that your animal's physically fit to be able to do it um that's kind of what i look for and you generally can see those things pretty quickly i've also got we've got a team of people that are involved in the assessment process. So our vets, obviously, um, our creative programs and animal behaviour manager, um, my fellow senior keeper, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that would look at these things. Um, but for us at the moment, our program is um, two red-tailed black cockatoos. So one is actually a southeastern. She's the first southeastern that we've actually had in care at the zoo in many, many years. And she is she is missing a wing. So she was found on a property near Mount Gambia by a participant in that project. Um, a landholder who found her, realised something was up and brought her down to the zoo. And we had to amputate the wing, unfortunately. Um, but she's an amazing ambassador, A, for that program, and B, for the work that occurs in the conservation space. So we've got her, we've got another red tail black that's in training. Um, she was found in a driveway after a storm in Adelaide. So we think she got blew, blown down to Adelaide from Mount Gambia. Um, we've got a galah. So we tell the story of galahs 
and how they've adapted, um, but also how we see them around us all the time. And there's still a lot of things about them that we don't we pay don't attention know. to. Yep. So it's about like, even though you see them all the time, pay attention. Um, we then have a black breasted buzzard that cracks open an emu egg, which is an instinctive behavior for them. You never have to teach yep. them how to do that. You show them an emu egg and they do it. So we make an emu egg out of plaster and um, we've got a sooty owl. So a lesser sooty owl by the name of Oscar, who I actually reared in Cairns for the show there, who's then been in Adelaide for the last five years and a barking owl. So we've got a barking owl called Albert Einstein and great name. And then a blue and gold macaw. Um, and then in training, we've got a black neck stork. So a, a juvenile black neck stork, which is going to be amazing, amazing, <laughs> that species. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I want to come and see that. It's, he's a mate. His name's Karumba after the um, small town up on the Gulf of Carpentaria, yeah, which was yeah, the first yeah. place I ever saw wild Jabiru. And I am obsessed with this bird. He's amazing. Yeah, and- um, and and for those who don't know, the Jabiru, Jabiru is the old name for the black neck stork. Correct, correct. Um, and so I love I love me black neck stork. And when he makes it into show, he'll be only the third one in a show on in the whole planet. So, so. we're very excited about him. Um, got a flock of African grey parrots, which we're training, and two cake parrots. Um, yeah. So we've got a pretty decent team of birds. We don't have a huge amount of spaces dedicated to free flight, so we have to be very, very picky Choosing about that. yeah, yeah, because we don't have spaces coming out the wazoo to dedicate to it. So we we we're very selective of the birds that we have, and then the role that they have. So it's it's a cool process. I love it, and we get to give people this amazing taste of bird life just enough to get them interested show them some cool behaviors um give them that immersive experience because the reality is when you look do the research people in a zoo spend on average two minutes standing in front of an aviary but they spend 15 to 20 minutes at a bird show so i've got just that much more time (laughs) and that uh, and half an hour in the line at the cafe exactly so we so and so you know where our messaging never stops you go to our zoos and we've got conservation messaging there we've got you know because it's the reality and we've got to get people where we can so yeah i haven't been to adelaide zoo for 15 years or so and i i'm really looking forward to coming again because 15 years ago i didn't think that adelaide zoo was a patch on melbourne but i'm guessing now that uh, and and that was from the point of view of the of the messaging, the interpretive mm-hmm. signage, the displays and whatnot. And I'm guessing it's a million times uh, improved uh, over that over that time. We work hard. We work very hard as a group of people. And you know, I've got an amazing we've got an amazing leadership team, but we've also got an amazing team of people across the organisation, volunteers who have made our two zoos really beautiful places to visit. And I, you know, I've worked in many places and it genuinely is a hand on heart. I'm not saying it because I currently work there. It is genuinely the, my favorite place that I've ever worked. Like it's, uh, it, it's, we, we talk the talk, but also as an organization, it's really nice to see an organization that genuinely walks the walk as well, particularly when we just don't have many resources, but we'll still, you know, last the last two years from COVID has been a real pressure on us financially, but never once did we scale back a financial commitment to a recovery program, a breeding program, ever. It it just wasn't ever on the cards. We scaled back other things, but that was never ever a question, which is so great to see. Yeah, that's that shows real commitment. Um, last chance, if you uh, for those watching, to give a. Uh, uh, to pose a question because we're running up to to time. Uh, I, we, we've actually only got a limit because 
uh, the stream will shut off, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we probably – look, the, I would love to, to talk more about the, uh, the ins and outs of the breeding programs if, um, uh, it, if, if that, you know, gets ticked off at some stage. I, I know people would be really interested – in uh, talking more about regents and uh, mm -hmm. and, and the plains wanderers, um, yeah, I know I know you're not the lead on uh, uh, on the on the plains wanderer in particular, but that's like the kookiest bird that's oh, that's that so weird. The, it, so that would be that would be a fun thing to do. Um, yeah, so Chad, I I hope you felt like you've told us everything we uh, we need we need to know the the, the last thing I, I guess it's important for people to know is if they want to come to one of the uh, uh, the free flight shows at um, at Adelaide do they have to book no so that's just part of your general admission so if you you walk in the gate you can come in and we're no longer requiring we're back to just you can buy your ticket at the gate now um, so you can, I, I would still probably advise people to pre book only because it makes your entry process faster. Um, but it, it, you don't have to, you can just rock up on the day, buy a ticket and come on in and, and it's part of the daily, the daily programming. So there's and, lots and lots to see and do. And on average, um, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you've got a pretty set timetable. How many shows a day are you doing and what's the earliest one? So currently we're doing one free flight a day at Adelaide. So we do an 11.30 free flight in the morning, 11.30 in the morning. And then we'll do, when we do the summer zoo in the summer holidays where we're open into the evening, we do a second free flight in the evening So um, for that program. But also we do, during the day, we do a, um, a feed and meet the keeper at our Southeast Asian walkthrough aviary. So you can come and meet the keeper there at okay. 1045 and we feed, we've got lorries. Um, so Southeast Asian lorries, Nicobar pigeons, all sorts of cool stuff there. And then in the afternoon, we do an Australian rainforest and wetlands um, meet the keeper and feed. So you can go into our rainforest and see our lyre bird and, and, and stuff like that. So, there's lots of bird nerd stuff to do as well as, oh, because we've got penguins and pelicans too on that list. So there's well, there's lots. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get Chad to give me the current info. I'll put it on, on the appropriate page, which will be birdemergency.com slash Chad. Um, we've got to do this, Chad. We've got to say thanks, Chad Criddle, Adelaide Zoo, Zoo's SA, for being on the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. Thanks for, uh, thanks for watching. I feel like I'm on TV now. Thanks for watching and uh, look forward to doing it again uh, very, very soon. Thanks, Chad. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Been a pleasure.